welcome to church, everybody. Man, it's a pretty, like, 10 a.m.'s feeling strong. I like it. Uh, if we've never had the chance to meet before, my name's Jonathan. My wife, Natasha, and I are the lead pastors here at EC. I got to know, did anybody get up early and watch Canada versus the U.S. in that World Cup of basketball? <laughs> what? Hey, you can just say nothing. That's fine, too, all right? Wow, man. <laughs> Holy cow. Okay, fine. I, guys, this is a big deal. For the first time since 1936, Canada won a medal in international basketball. That's right. And, and wait, wait, wait. They didn't beat like Slovenia or Uzbekistan or, you know, the Mongolian Republic. They beat the United States today in basketball. I just, I just feel like it's a big deal. Um, don't doesn't matter that it was the bronze medal game because they did lose to some of those other teams earlier on. We beat the United States. It's amazing. Um, all right. Hi. If you're here from the United States, welcome. Glad to have you. <laughs> we are the crown on top of North America. That is Canada. All right. Proverbs chapter 16. Now we own hockey and we own basketball. I don't know if we're going to own football anytime soon. Okay. Proverbs 16, chapter uh, 6, chapter 6, wow. Proverbs 16, verse 18. First pride, then the crash. The bigger the ego, the harder the fall. First pride, then the crash. The bigger the ego, the harder the fall. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much that you're here today. Thank you that you are uh, available God, we didn't just step into a room. We stepped into an encounter. We ask that you'd speak to our hearts, illuminate truth from your word, strengthen us in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, TKO, my ego. The idea of this series is built around um, this thought that if I don't learn how to TKO or to, to submit and to control my ego, that my ego will control me. And so before you tune me out, because somebody's like, well, I'm not arrogant, but I'm going to stay because my husband needs this. Uh, just chill. Uh, ego, ego is simply Latin for I. And to have a massive ego just means you think about yourself way too much. So you can be arrogant and have a big out of control ego. You can also be really insecure and have a big out of control ego. And we live in a culture that is obsessed with ego. We're obsessed with self. We're, and, and, and inside the heart of every person is this, this boxing match. There's this fight. There's this battle happening where in one corner, you've got the person God created you to be. And in the other corner, you've got your alter ego, this sinful nature. In fact, that's how it's described in Galatians. You've got the, the spirit person the, the new you, the one that's come alive in Christ, and then you've got the old you, and they are constantly at war for control. And so what we're learning in this series is how do I allow the new me, the, the spirit of God on the inside of me, to crush, to submit, to control my alter ego, the me that wants to do things that I don't really want to do, but my desires are out of control. So our case study has been a guy named Jacob. Uh, to bring you up to speed on Jacob's story. Uh, he's been fighting his whole life. In fact, uh, the Bible tells us that he was fighting with his twin brother in his mother's womb was a violent conflict. Um, Jacob was born. Jacob then deceived his way into getting the birthright from his brother. He deceived his way into getting a blessing from his father. These are all big deals. Now he's on the run from his older brother Esau who wants to murder him and take him out. Uh, Jacob is in his late 70s. He's, 70s, he's 76, 77 years old. He's not married yet. The dating pool in Beersheba has really dried up. Neither, I mean, this guy's Christian mingle is getting zero hits, all right? Like his profile is like, hi, I'm Jake, I'm 77, I'm smooth skin, I'm an egomaniac, I'm a mama's boy, I'm looking for a girl to essentially take my mom's place, coddle me and make all of my dreams come true. Not getting a lot of action on his profile. And so his mom is like, hey, Jacob, listen, for your safety and so you can find a spouse, you need to go back to my homeland. There'll be somebody there for you. On his way, 
We talked about this last week. Jacob has this powerful encounter with the Lord. It's actually a gracious encounter where somebody who doesn't really deserve it has this moment where God visits with him and speaks to him. And, um, Jacob's story and the character of Jacob is somebody that, uh, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Like on one, on one hand, uh, it's encouraging. On another hand, it's kind of discouraging. But I, I take some comfort in it because Jacob is complicated. He's broken. He's messed up. He makes a lot of bad decisions, yet God's grace is so good that he still takes Jacob in the middle of nowhere and he has this divine encounter. Man, I love that. Because you know what? I'm complicated. I'm broken. I'm messed up. I've got a laundry list of issues, but God, if he'll meet with Jacob, he'll meet with me. If God has a plan for Jacob, he'll have a plan for me. If God has a destiny for Jacob, then he's got a destiny for me. Um, I also, it's challenging because you see Jacob have this divine moment, and like we're going to see as we get into his story, he has a great moment with God, and then he makes a lot of stupid decisions after that, which again, I don't know, but I just find that quite comforting because I can be in a church service like this, and I got my seat, and I, I got my hands up, and I'm like, oh, the earth will shout, and I'm singing, and the band is leading me, and I'm having this great moment, and I know that I will make wrong decisions this week, but just, so will you. Don't pretend you won't. You will. And we can take comfort in the fact that if God is leading a guy like Jacob, has a plan for a guy like Jacob, then even us, who are well-intended but will still make a mistake, who are well-intended but there will be moments when, like, my alter ego gets a couple shots in on the, the new nature, and if God uses Jacob, he can use us too. It's not just me. So, okay, Genesis chapter 29, verse 1. Then Jacob continued on his journey and came to the land of the eastern peoples. There he saw a well in the open country with three flocks of sheep lying near it because the flocks were watered from that well. The stone over the mouth of the well was large. When all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone away from the well's mouth and water the sheep. Then they would return the stone to its place over the mouth of the well. Jacob asked the shepherds, my brothers, where are you from? We're from Haran, they replied. That's amazing, that's where he's headed. Then he says, do you guys happen to know Laban? I, I love this. Um, I feel like every time we're in the States, somebody's like, hey, do you know Mike from Calgary? I'm like, what are you, what's wrong with you, you know? Um, that's kind of what Jacob's doing. He's like, oh, do you know Laban? But they do. They're like, yeah, we know him. Jacob says, well, is he well? How's he doing? They say, yeah, he's great. Here comes his daughter, Rachel, with the sheep. And then he, then he this is like so, um, so what we would expect from Jacob because he, he says, look, the sun is still high, it's not time for the flocks to be gathered. Water the sheep and get them back to pasture. Just understand what's happening. Jacob is the new guy. He does not know these shepherds. Jacob uh, does not have any sheep. We know from uh, studying his earlier life, he wasn't an outdoorsy guy. He didn't do those things. He kind of stayed home and hung out in the kitchen. So he doesn't have any experience. He doesn't even have anything with him. He basically just has his walking stick that he took when he ran away from his brother. And he has the audacity to look at three groups of shepherds and say, hey, guys, uh, there's still some daylight. Maybe you shouldn't waste your time staring at the well. Grab a drink and get back out there so the sheep can eat. They say, oh, we can't. Until all the flocks are gathered and the stones have been rolled away from the mouth of the well, then we will water the sheep. Now, what they're saying, but they're not really saying, but they're saying is that we can't move the stone until there's more shepherds here to help. It's a big stone, and they would have these set watering times where they would all gather, and a group of them would move the stone together so the sheep could drink. Well, while he's still talking with them, verse 9 says, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherd. When Jacob saw Rachel, daughter of his uncle Laban, and Laban's sheep, he went over and rolled the stone away from the, this is like, this is the best, rolled the stone away from the mouth of the well and watered his uncle's sheep. He's like, who's the girl? He sees her coming. I mean, she's beautiful. We'll learn more about that in a moment. She's a boss lady. She's got, she walks up into this male-dominated profession, and she's got her own crew of sheep. Come on, ladies. And, uh, which also meant that her family was wealthy because they had sheep. And, and um, so all of this is great. He puts this together. He's like, man, there's a hot girl. There's a bunch of useless guys, uh, betas, who aren't doing anything about this rock. And, and so he just walks over, and he's like, I've got this. And he summons up this 77-year-old old man strength, and he moves the rock and says, drink, my love. It's an amazing picture. 
I t- listen, I totally get the extra motivation of wanting to be a hero when a beautiful girl is around. It's a good thing we don't follow some of you guys at the gym. Um, but a, a few weeks ago, Natasha and I were, we were getting away for a couple nights. We were going to stay in the mountains. We're on our way to the hotel. And we are like literally on my map. We're like six minutes from our destination. I'm pumped. I'm like, yes. I love my kids, but I'm pumped that we have a couple of nights without the kids. And we're six minutes, and I'm, I'm, I'm just excited to have lots of good talks. And so um, we're just going to a lot of heart-to-heart conversations. We're just going to really. So I'm, I'm pumped. And I got my bride, and she's beautiful, and we're, spend, we're about to spend some time together. And up ahead, I see an SUV pulled over with a flat tire and a couple of elderly people hanging out in the shade of their trunk. And there's a few things that happen. Firstly, it's like, I'm not the right guy to offer vehicle assistance. <laughs> so my initial impulse is to drive by. But, but or, or, you know, every now and then I would consider maybe stopping in with my AMA card, but I'm six minutes away. So they'll be fine. Um, but then I get closer and I realize they're driving an old Nissan Armada. And I'm like... I'm driving an old Nissan Armada. I'm like, this is my moment. I know this vehicle. I've changed my own tire so many times. And then I start to think, what better way to set up a romantic couple of days than to help somebody on the side of the road? And so we pull, we pull over, and I get out, and I'm like, hey, I'm here to help. I don't want to say I'm a godsend, but maybe I am. And uh, I, get to, I meet them, I get the spare tire out, I jack up the vehicle, I'm feeling pretty good. And I listen, I'm, like, this is the perfect setup for me. What could be more attractive to my wife than me out in the hot sun, grueling, changing a tire, being a good Samaritan? I'm doing the right thing. Listen, I didn't want to get my date shirt dirty, so I even, I said, just a minute, I'll be back. And I went over by my vehicle, and I let Natasha watch while I took off my shirt. I'm like, you know, my body doesn't glisten like it did 18 years ago, but I'm still feeling like this is a good moment for me. She's definitely watching me. There are some endorphins going off. Put on a shirt that was is like a schmedium. It's way too small, but I'm like, this is my moment. And, and I am... I'm releasing, I'm sweating, so I know that there are scents that are tapping into her primal instincts. I'm like, she's looking at, I can tell her looking at me. I'm like, I got you, I got you. I get down to keep working on the, I, I get, I get all the, the nuts off, and, and, and I, I go to take the tire off, and the tire is seized onto the vehicle. I'm like, God, I offered a sacrifice of praise. I was like, Lord, please. You know what this means to me. You know what I'm trying to set up here. Our relationship needs this to work. And so I'm reefing on the tire. Like the whole vehicle is shaking. I'm, I like, I pulled something, mule kicking the tire. I was like, I probably spent 25 minutes just like, I didn't have a sledgehammer. I didn't have the mallets and stuff that I have at home when this happens. So then I'm like, guys, listen, I know exactly what to do. We're going to drop the vehicle down. I'm not going to put any of the nuts back on. We're just going to drive a little bit and we're just going to see if that tire loosens up. And so we drive and they they were terrified. They didn't trust me at all and I don't blame them. But we drove a little bit. Nothing happened. And then I get it back up and I'm reefing on it some more. And then their son shows up. Like way to love your parents. It's been 90 minutes. (laughs) Um, But as soon as he got there, I was like, Natasha, get in the car. We got to go. And we get in the car, we're driving, and she's like, that was so abrupt. You didn't even say goodbye. Why? I said, I am not sticking around to watch some joker get the tire off the vehicle. <laughs> the whole point of this stop was that you would look at me and admire me. I don't want you to be like, well, it's really great that he came. No. And we didn't, we didn't ask any, we didn't check up on them. For all I know, they got eaten by wolves, and I don't care. So I get it. I get the instinct in Jacob to see the beautiful girl be like, I've got this. I just imagine it being like, hey, you see that? You see me help, helping these guys by myself? See what I did? At this point, coming off his encounter with the Lord, it, it sort of seems like things are actually working out pretty good for Jacob on his journey. I mean, he comes to a well. That's good. 
He meets people who are from the same place he's going. That's great. He meets people who know the people he knows. That's even better. Then he sees on his journey for a wife, a beautiful girl walks up. Then he gets to show off in front of her, muscles the rock off the well. But then things get really weird. It says, Jacob kissed Rachel. Wow. <laughs> so that's that's kind of where it starts, actually. That's... But then he began to weep aloud. Like, he goes from like, it's like, oh my God, I love you so much. Like, he's just crying. Pull yourself together, Jake. Does he not know that this is totally ruining all of his cred? He told Rachel he's a relative of her father and a son of Rebecca, so she runs to her father. We actually don't. Did she run to her dad like, Dad, there's a creepy old guy kissing me and crying. Like, or did she run to her dad like, Dad, you'll never believe it. I met a relative. He's handsome. As soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he hurried to meet him. He embraced him and kissed him, which I'm glad that's not uh, as normal now. Um, brought him to his home. And there Jacob, t- Jacob told him all these things. And Laban said to him, you are my own flesh and blood. After Jacob stayed with him an entire month, Laban said to him, just because you're a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Now, Laban is excited to see Jacob. And a month after Jacob working, Laban's like, man, I can't let you work for free. Let's get your wages sorted out. And then into the middle of that conversation, we get some background on Laban's daughters, Leah and Rachel. It says Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Now, if you're If you're trying to soften the blow of the text, you would read it and be like, well, she has weak eyes. It just means she has poor eyesight. Well, if that was the comparison that was trying to be made, then it would say Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had great vision. That's not the comparison because it says Leah has weak eyes, but Rachel has a lovely figure and was beautiful. Rachel has the knockout bod and Leah has a great personality at best. (laughs) It's what it says. I mean, this is tough. Uh, You know, imagine being Leah, the older sister. Nobody is asking Laban to marry Leah. Nobody's coming to Laban to be like, man, your older daughter, hey? No, no, no. They're all like, what about Rachel? And, And so even though she's the older sister, for most of her life, she's been living in the shadow and the of the beauty of her younger sister, Rachel. And now Jacob has fallen hard for Rachel, but he showed up broke. And the custom of the day would be that you would give a dowry to the father. You have to show that you can support. You've got to save up. You've got to, it's going to cost you something to take his daughter's hand in marriage. So for a wage, Jacob quick on his feet says, listen, I'm broke, but I'll work for seven years if you'll give me the honor of marrying Rachel. Seven years is actually about three to four times what would have been an acceptable price. He doesn't care. She's worth it, man. I will overpay for her. So Laban says, well, it's better that I give her to you than to some other man, which is not really what you're going for either. Like, I'm glad that when I called Natasha's dad, he's like, well, better you you than someone else. Um, So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Oh, it's amazing. This is a hallmark moment. Think about it for a minute. You got a guy in a small town running away from his own family drama, meets a girl at the local watering hole, a guy who's kind of white collar, gets a blue collar job working with her dad on the farm. They fall in love. And then it's that beautiful hallmark line of like, "Ah, it seemed like only a few days. That turns quick though. Because then Jacob says to Laban, give me my wife. My time is completed. I want to make love to her. <laughs> it's like, it seemed like only a few days. I want her. Like, give me. I want to make love. I'm old school, okay? I think that a guy should ask a girl for a father's blessing to get married. I don't think that give me, I want to make love to her is going to get you very far. Okay? <laughs> I was like, as I read this, I'm like, how would my father-in-law have responded if I called him and said, hey, 
Give her to me. I want to make love to her. He probably would have got on a plane and beat the junk out of me. So I'm just like, there's a way to do it and there's a way not to do it. And so Laban is like, yeah, great, man. And so he hires a DJ, throws a party, brings everybody together at the place and gave a feast. Uh, my guess is that this wedding had an open bar. Um, because that's the only way I can think to explain what happens next in the story. It says, but when evening came, okay, so we are, it's the, just, it's the wedding night. It's the wedding between Rachel, the young, it's hot Rachel, the young one, and it's Leah with the crazy eyes. And it's, he's marrying Rachel. It's their wedding night. And it says, Laban took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and Jacob made love to her. Jacob is a bad sign. And Laban gave his servant Zilpah, Zilpah, uh, Zilpah to his daughter as her attendant. Guys, this is all bad. When morning came, there was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, what is this you've done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Laban replied, it's not in our custom. I love Laban. He's like, well... It's just not the way we do things around here. You should have known. We don't marry off the younger one first. No, finish this daughter's bridal week. Then we'll give you the younger one also. In, what's better than one wife? Two wives in eight days. <laughs> but you need to work another seven years. And Jacob did so. He finished the week with Leah. And then Laban gave, Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her attendant. Jacob made love to Rachel also. And his love for Rachel was greater than his love for Leah. And he worked for Laban another seven years. <laughs> Guys, this is like, um, this is like Dr. Phil... Sister wives, if you're old school, it's a little bit of Jerry Springer, all rolled into one beautiful love story. And, and um, every now and then, people will read stories like this, especially through the Old Testament, where you see polygamy is sort of normalized and think, well, if, the, if, the, if it was, why would the Bible celebrate something like polygamy? Why was that normal? And I just want to make mention, if you read it and think that the Bible is celebrating it, then you're not reading the full story. Because every single time you see a relationship like this with multiple partners, the underlying conditions of the home are absolute misery, chaos, and ruin. And so what the Bible is actually doing every time you see a relationship like this is reinforcing the value of one man and one woman in a monogamous relationship before God and saying, hey, avoid all of this chaos, just have one wife. Thank you, Lord, for the advice. So you've got this, this is all happening. Um, I find it interesting that Laban greets Jacob with a lot of affection. He greets my, my family, and he hugs him and kisses him, and, and uh, he's flattering him. And the truth is, as nice as it seemed in the moment, Laban is actually manipulating Jacob the entire time. Because see, Laban knows that Jacob is, is Abraham's grandson. He knows that there's a, a divine blessing and promise on Jacob's life. And so Laban is scheming from the beginning. I've got to find a way to get this guy to be part of my family so my family can be part of the blessing. And, and, and so just, just be reminded that not everybody who flatters you has your best interests in mind. Not everybody who's kind to you, let's take it a step further, not everybody who kisses you wants what's best for you. So we read this and we're like, man, this is crazy stuff. I mean, Jacob wakes up next to Leah. It's not what he expected. It's not what he'd been working for. And so for just a moment, take the idea that these are two people out of the equation and just ask yourself, um, has there ever been a moment where you've worked hard for something and not received what you expected to receive at the end of it? Have you ever been in a situation where it's like, God, I'm going to be focused and I'm going to be dedicated and I'm going to be disciplined and then the results aren't what you hoped for? Has there ever been a, a time in your life when, when you've, you've worked for something or, um, uh, or, or you've, you've thought about something, you've played it over like, man, God, I'm, I'm confident I'm going to do this, this, and this, and I'm sure this is how things are going to work out, and it did not work out the way you'd idealize. There is a strong theme of disappointment in Jacob's life. 
I'm sure we can relate to it. And listen, I know we can relate to it because it's not just a theme in Jacob's life. It is like this cosmic theme of the human existence that there will be moments of disappointment. This happens to us all the time. We, we imagine, we fantasize particular outcomes to situations. Hey, what would life be like if, and then when it doesn't work out, we're dealt a blow. Oh, man, that hurts. Very rarely do things work out exactly as we imagine. Oh, God, I'm so excited I get to start this new job. And then you realize a few weeks in that the new job comes with new stress. And all of a sudden, what you're hoping was Rachel, um, you know, that it would be like, uh, hey, there's Leah moment in your life. Oh, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. Uh, you move to a new city looking for a fresh start. Or you come to a new church looking for a fresh start. And then all of a sudden you realize that people are people are people are people. It doesn't matter where they are or what seat they have or what church they attend. You're like, wow, people are crazy everywhere. Oh, there's Leah. I thought it was going to be different. Even in marriage. You can get married and, and idealize what you think it's going to be like and get several years in and be like, man, this is a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. This is a lot more work than I thought it was going to be. And all of a sudden, it's like, it might be the same girl, but it's like, wow, there's Leah. This isn't what we expected. Raising kids, the expectation versus reality. Oh, I can't wait to have a kid. Man, gonna be, they're going to love me. Yeah, until they're teenagers. They're going to be so easy, and then you, you have them, and, and, you know, they're just cuddly, and, 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 and they're like, you know, but then they grow up, and you think, it, the deception of being a first-time parent is that you think as they get older, it's just going to get easier. Guys, it gets way worse. It's like way better and way harder at the same time, because the issues get more complicated than they peed their pants, and you're navigating things, and it's beautiful and wonderful, but... It's, it's not always Rachel, sometimes it's Leah. So the question isn't really, will we be disappointed? The, the question is, how will we respond to being disappointed? So we're all going to be disappointed. I, I don't have time to run every possible situation and scenario, but even as I talk about disappointment here, for some of you, it's a negative pregnancy test. For some of you, it's the doctor's report. For some of you, it's the marriage you're in right now. For some of you, it's the marriage you were in at one time. For, like, I can't fill in your blanks. We'll be disappointed. But how will we be when we're disappointed? And we can see how quickly Jacob's ego comes to the surface under pressure. Um, Jacob... Uh, his alter ego takes over real quick when things don't go his way. And, and we see that in his response to Laban when he says, what have you done to me? Why have you deceived me? Now just notice firstly how incredibly self-absorbed Jacob is. Like there are other people involved in this mess. He doesn't ask about Leah. Laban, how could you do that to your oldest daughter? Like um, Leah is the girl nobody wants. Her dad didn't want her. Her husband didn't want her. And now she's in a loveless marriage. But Jacob never once says, hey, what about Leah? I actually don't know if Jacob really loved Rachel as much as he just lusted after Rachel because he doesn't even ask about her. How could you do this to your daughter? She's, we've been waiting seven years. I've worked. She's been patient. We did everything right. This was her wedding night. Then you double cross her. He doesn't even ask. He just says, how could you do this to me? Beyond his clear self-absorption, when the pressure hits, he says, how, how have you, why have you deceived me? What's ironic about that? is that Jacob's name means deceiver. And if you go back to Genesis chapter 27, the word that's used to describe how Jacob treats his family is the same word that's translated here, deceive. So, so it's like, like ego is so quick to point out faults in others but not take responsibility for myself. Ego is so quick to be, why did you deceive me? Instead of acknowledging, oh, I've been deceiving people my entire life. Imagine, when Jacob was on his wedding night, he thought he was with Rachel. Now it's dark, and she would, as would have been the custom, have a veil on, so she's wearing something that hides her appearance, and Jacob is deceived into thinking it's another person. 
Now, if you flash back a little bit, what happened? Well, Isaac was losing his eyesight, so it's dark for Isaac. And Jacob goes in pretending to be Esau, puts a disguise on, and so Isaac is fooled. Jacob did the exact same thing to Isaac as Leah and Rachel did to him. Same thing. We've seen this story before, but ego is so preoccupied in finding fault, Jacob doesn't stop for a minute and be like, oh, I know exactly. I know that I wrote the book on this trick right here. I, I, they learned this from me. No, no, no. He doesn't even stop. He just blames Laban and said, how could you? That's our response often when things don't go our way. When we get disappointed, we have this real tendency to lash out emotionally and try and blame and project responsibility onto others instead of ever stopping to wonder, hey, do I have a part to play in this? That's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 4, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I Like Jacob, if he just closed his mouth for a moment and appreciated the irony, he, would, he wouldn't be so concerned with the speck of deceit in Laban's eye. He'd be like, wait, I got planks coming out of both eyes. My entire life up to this point, everything I've had, everything I've gained, every relationship that's been close to me has been marked by deceit and betrayal. That's what I've done. And now it's just catching up to me. And the truth is life will catch up to you. You, you might get away with living one way for a season, but you won't get away, away with it forever. We don't, we, don't like, we don't talk about karma. I, I don't really believe in karma. But you know what I believe in? I believe in Galatians chapter 6, the principle of sowing and reaping, the fact that God cannot be mocked. What a man sows, he will reap. What you put into the ground, you will take out of the ground. Jacob spent an entire lifetime depositing deceit into the ground of his life, and now he's shocked when he's harvesting deceit in his relationships? No, we reap what we sow. You reap what you sow. If we, if we reap deception, don't be surprised if we end up deceived. If we reap selfishness, it's all about me all the time, all about me. Don't be surprised if someday you're all alone because it's been all about you forever. If, if, we, if we reap, like parents, if you reap not making church a priority and not having godly values in your home, don't be surprised when your kids not want, want nothing to do with the Lord as adults because you made it optional when they were kids. You will reap what you sow. Don't be shocked. When you wake up next to Leah, chances are we have some responsibility that needs to be taken. If, if you don't have a regular practice of like starting your day and giving your worries and your cares to the Lord, casting your cares on him, don't be surprised if by 2 p.m. you're an anxious, stressed out mess because, you, listen, you're reaping what you've sown. If you woke up and thought, I can do today in my own strength, you'll see where that gets you by the end of the day. But there's something about sowing into the ground. God, I'm gonna give you today. I'm gonna give you my emotions. I'm gonna give you these meetings. I'm gonna give you these crazy kids. I'm gonna give you my anxiety. I'm going to cast it all on you. And then watch what happens. Like you'll start reaping the benefits of having sown faith. Yes. You reap what you sow. Yes. The amount of people who come in and want to talk about relationships. And it's, it's so heartbreaking because they're sitting there and it's destruction. But when you really get down to it, they've been reaping ungodly patterns of behavior. And now they're frustrated and surprised when all of a sudden there's Leah and their relationship has fallen apart. We will reap what we sow. What are you sowing into the ground of your life. And can I encourage you? It's not too late to start sowing right into the ground of your life. It's actually never too late to start sowing right. If you're reaping something right now, if you're living in those like, ah, it's Leah moments where it's like, this is not what I wanted. Just start sowing. Start sowing now. Start sowing faith. Start sowing faithfulness. Start sowing boundaries. Start sowing conviction. Start sowing healthy habits. You can change a harvest in a season. Jacob had this encounter with the grace of God. But the grace of God doesn't mitigate all the consequences of our dumb decisions. It's just, the, it's, it's a hard truth. It's, here's what the grace of God does. We are saved by grace through faith. 
So the grace of God will deal with the consequences of our sin and make sure that we are eternally right with our Heavenly Father. But there are still things we choose to do here on earth, and we will have to live in the consequences of our actions. The, the simplest, it's like, I know if I smash a bowl of ice cream at 1030 at night, I will get up at 3 and I will not feel good. I know that. It's just, the, it's, there are consequences to my actions and that's a really simple example, but there are consequences to our actions, and we have to make sure that, that we, we actually do what Jacob should have done, and that's just take a pause. Like before he responds emotionally, before he lashes out, before he's quick to be angry, just pause and consider the situation. James chapter 1, verse 19 says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, Slow to become angry, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Man, if we're, we got to stop being angry Christians. Because it doesn't produce righteousness. It doesn't look good. The anger, man, we're so quick to jump to conclusions when we're under pressure. We get unhinged with our emotions. We make assumptions about people. We get angry because our ego is in control, saying, I've got to be right. What if... What if, do you know that like just pausing is like a chokehold on your ego? Like just, just not responding emotionally, just not responding. You can just choke your ego out. Just pause for a moment. God, is there any way in me that needs correcting? God, what part have I played in this situation? God, how did I get here? What am I responsible for? What changes do I need to make? And all of a sudden, you start, you give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to speak to you. You start to realize, man, I can't blame everybody else for where I am. I have to carry some responsibility. And beyond the ego that blames and points fingers, we, <laughs> Jacob also is in this crazy situation well, I don't think he pursued Rachel for honorable reasons. I think um, if he pursued her for honorable reasons, he would have said like, hey, Laban, I'd like to marry your daughter. I'd like to start a family with her. I'd like to protect her. I'd like to build her a home. I want to have a lot of grandkids. I want to pass off a legacy and a heritage. No, he didn't say that. He's like, hey, I want to get with your daughter. I just don't think the intentions were right. And just consider what's happening in his life. Jacob's life is empty. He never had the love of his father. He went to his mother and he had her affection for a time, but now he's gone from home. She's far away. He's lost everything because when you cheat to get ahead, it'll slip through your fingers before you know it. And after he sees Rachel, it's this unrealistic expectation like, man, if I could have her, I'll have meaning. If I could have her, everything will be all right. If I could have her, it will fix the dysfunction in my life. And all of his longing for significance and security and meaning and satisfaction is projected onto this one woman. Things that should come from God, he now projects onto his wife. Listen, no person can handle the weight of Godhood. It can't happen. Ernest Becker, who is... Um, an atheist thinker actually wrote The Denial of Death, and he said this. An atheist said this about our current culture. One of the main ways secular culture deals with the God vacuum is through, crazy phrase, apocalyptic sex and romance. We've loaded our desire for transcendence onto romance and love. What is he saying? He's saying, in the absence of God in our lives... The next closest thing to some level of euphoria and satisfaction is to pursue recklessly sexual moments and relationships. We've, we've turned relationships into God. And we see that in Jacob and his need to feel heroic and his need to feel like the man and his need to feel like he's got meaning and purpose. He places all of this weight on Rachel. Man, no person can live up to that weight and level of responsibility. That's actually a really easy, easy way to frustrate your relationship. You want to wake up next to Leah? Start expecting your wife to be God. No, I think that one of the healthiest things we can do is take our spouse and drop them down to like the second spot in our lives and make sure God stays in the top spot, save you a lot of fights, a lot of chaos. 
but it's this codependent behavior where we get so invested in another person um, that we can't function independently. And ego drives this codependency because I need that validation and I need that acknowledgement and my identity is coming from there. And, and, and we do it in relationships. We do it with like places like church. We do it with friend groups. Like, I need this from Jeff. I don't get this. That's not to say that there shouldn't be healthy expectations, but when your identity is wrapped up in another person, it's dangerous. Pause. God, am I dependent on you or am I being codependent on somebody else to satisfy the deepest longings? Just pause. Take a minute. Now consider Leah for a moment. <laughs> Leah, the girl nobody wanted. It says in verse 31, when the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive but Rachel remained childless. Leah had lived her life unwanted, overlooked, and heartbroken. And, and just, uh, it's, it's fun to kind of tell the story and, and, and unpack the weak eyes and everything. Take that, take physical appearance out of it for just a minute. I'm sure that there are Leahs in the room today in the manner that you have felt unwanted, overlooked, You've been heartbroken, questioned your own value. Can I encourage you? God wanted Leah when she felt like nobody else did. God is the real bridegroom. God is the one that swoops in and says, hey, I know you feel unwanted and you feel overlooked and you feel broken, but I have a purpose for you and a plan for you and a destiny for you and I want relationship with you. And, and, and then all of a sudden, Leah becomes pregnant in verse 32 and she gives birth to a son. She named him Reuben, Rubes for short. <laughs> so this is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband, listen, God gives her the gift of a son and she, she can't just give credit to the Lord. She's like, ah, oh, the, the Lord saw my misery, but now, oh, hopefully now, God's not enough. Hopefully now my husband will love me. Oh, I, I just wanna be seen by my husband. That's her primary goal and objective. She's still anchoring her value to a person, codependent. Then she conceives again. She gives birth to another son. Oh, because the Lord heard that I'm not loved by my husband. He gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. You see the same thing. It's like, oh, God, I, I, I just want Jacob to see me. Maybe now that I have this son, he'll see me. And then I just want Jacob to hear me. I, I so desperately want him to hear me. So maybe now he'll listen. Then she conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, now at last my husband will become attached to me because I've borne him three sons. So no, notice God keeps giving her like these miracles and she's like, oh, it's all about Jacob for her. She's so obsessed. Now I've got my third son. Hopefully he'll be attached to me. Like I just want the attachment. And, and, and listen, a lot of us live our lives in that same cycle. I just need to be seen by somebody. I just need to be heard by somebody. I just want to feel like I'm attached or I belong to somebody. They are great desires, but it's a misplaced target. Then finally, in verse 35, she conceived again. And listen, I'm going to Leah because I'll be honest with you. Sometimes Jacob screws things up so bad like we do, it's hard to pull the good out of his actions. But we look at Leah here, and it's, she conceived again. And when she gave birth to her son, she said, this time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah. Then she stopped having children. No kidding, lady, it's number four. <laughs> then she stopped having children. I love Look at the different language. She's like, this time, it's going to be different. This time, when I feel disappointed and unloved and overlooked, I'm not going to reach back to another person. This time, I'm going to do it differently. And this time, when I, when I feel that way, I'm going to praise the Lord. It's a change. She's not looking for Jacob. She's not looking for Laban. She doesn't need the affirmation from anywhere else. She finally hits that place in her relationship with God. She's like, this time, I'm just gonna praise. 
C.S. Lewis says this about our anchoring our identity and hope in Christ. If I find myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Leah comes to the end of her rope and she's like, Jacob is not satisfying me. Laban is not, my dad is not taking care of me. Nobody really loved me the way I needed to be loved. And there must be something else. And she finally looks heavenward. Every time we praise, you want to you wanna TKO your ego? You pause. Man, but you also praise. Oh, that sounds so, that sounds so simplistic. I, listen, don't mistake simple for foundational. Because it's generally in our faith journey, the simple things that we overlook. We overcomplicate it so much. If you just pause, let the Holy Spirit speak to you. If you just praise, man, praise expresses approval. Praise, not approval of my situation, but of the God who's in control. Praise expresses my admiration. And every time I make the decision to praise, that can be here in the room when the band is going and the lights are low. That can be in my car on the way to work. Every time I praise, I submit my ego one more time. Praise is powerful. Listen, when Paul and Silas praised at midnight in jail, the foundations of their cell shook, the doors opened, and the chains fell off. When the people praised around the city of Jericho, the walls came down. Psalm 100 verse 4 says, we enter his gates with thanksgiving in our hearts, and we enter his courts with praise. You want to be intimate with the Lord? Praise. It's like the key that opens up the access to the deepest places of the Holy Spirit. Psalm 42 11, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why disturbed within me? Put your hope in God for yet I will praise him. Psalm 9 verse 2, I will rejoice and be glad. I will sing praises to your name most high. Psalm 63 verse 3, I will praise you as long as I live. I'm just trying to encourage you today. Don't let your emotions take over. Don't let your ego run the show. Don't let your ego take down the God person that's on the inside of you. But we pause and we praise. When you're frustrated, praise. When you're sick, God, I'll praise you anyways. When you're disappointed, God, it hurts, but I'm going to praise you, God. When I'm lonely, I'm going to praise. When I don't know what's happening in my future, I'm going to praise. When things don't go according to plan, we praise. And praise will change your perspective. And praise takes my eyes off of me. And praise puts my eyes on Jesus. But it also elevates what I'm looking at so that I can see the bigger picture. And there was a bigger picture in Leah's life. She couldn't see it. But God was orchestrating events because Judah, the one that she praised for, out of Judah would come Shiloh, out of Shiloh would come the kings, out of the kings would come David, out of David would come Christ. So the one who was overlooked, the one who was unwanted, the one who felt forgotten and betrayed and heartbroken, God said, hey, hang on, I am working the details of your life. I am stitching the story together so that Leah... The one who nobody wanted would be the one who everybody needed because Christ came from Leah. I just want to encourage you today. May us crush our ego. Let's pause. Let's pray. Would you stand with me from the front to the back? I, I just believe that there's something about praise that God wants to unlock in our church and wants to unlock in our lives and in our hearts. So we're not just a worship when things are going well, church. We're not just a worship when the, then the setting is perfect, church. We're like a worship in all circumstances kind of church. We're a worship when it sucks. And we're worship when it's hard. And we're worship when it's difficult. Can you just bow your heads with me for a moment? God, I thank you so much for your power and your presence here today. God, I thank you that you are doing a work in our hearts. God, I thank you that you, God, have, have moved on us today, encouraging us in our worship. God, thank you that when everything else is falling apart, God, we will join in all the earth. God, we'll shout your praise. God, that our, our hearts will, will look to you. God, thank you for the shift in perspective that you promise as we worship. God, give us the strength. God, the courage, the wisdom to pause when we need to, to praise always, and in doing so, submitting and subduing our ego. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I wonder if there's somebody in the room today, and maybe uh, you're here, maybe it's your first time, maybe you've been coming for a while, but you've never had a moment where you've given your life to Christ. You've never had a moment where you've said, okay, God, um, I can't keep doing this by myself. I need a relationship with you. I wanna give you that opportunity right here, right now. 
You've been trying to do this thing in your own strength. Jesus is in the room inviting you into relationship. If that's you, I'm gonna count to three. And I'm gonna, when I hit three, I just want you to slip up your hand real quick. And by doing that, you're just letting me know who I'm praying with. If that's you, here we go. You're gonna trust Jesus with your future. Here we go, one, two, three. If that's you, slip up your hand. Go ahead real quick. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. So many hands, the front, the back, through the middle. You guys can put your hands down. That's great. If you raise the hand today, or maybe you're making that decision in your heart, would you repeat this really simple prayer after me? Uh, EC, let's pray together. Say, Jesus, I need you. I want to have a relationship with you. Come into my heart. Forgive me my sins. I trust you with my future. Amen.